Hi, guys. Welcome. Thank you, Ethan. I thought that was a really interesting conversation and in bridging into what we want to talk about here today. My name is Aurora Belfrag. I'm uh, with EQT Ventures and previously partnered uh, at the citizens journalism platform Your Middle East. We've got uh, Mohammed here who's flown in from, uh, from South Africa, previously with Al Jazeera, uh, and now deputy CEO at, uh, also chairman, sorry, at the um, Global Voices, yeah. and deputy uh, CEO at the Media Development Investment Fund. And Thank Ethan, you. you had the stage, so uh, we're... Um, You're already sick of me, it's fine. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that one. But the conversation that we want to have today bridges on from what we were talking about earlier, and it's protecting your online voice. Uh, and in the context of the 20 minutes that we have today, it'd be really interesting to maybe define the challenge that we have in terms of freedom of speech uh, and democracy when it comes to the online, and then hopefully funnel the conversation down to some stuff that's going on, happening, that's positive, and maybe leave with some action points where we can contribute. This is my plan. Too enthusiastic. Sounds good. I'm with you. Right. Good, good, good. <laughs> so before we start, let's put this in, in some context in what you're doing on a daily basis within protecting online voice. Right. So, you know, I think there's, I think what's really interesting to look at when we start talking about protecting online voices is really to pull back and talk about sort of this greater societal picture of free speech. Because I think we can't look at online free speech in isolation. Um, and you know, one of the lenses that I like to look at this in is sort of something that's quite obscene, right? The most obscene, uh, not that type of obscene, <laughs> but uh, you know, sort of the most obscene example of when free speech has been under threat. Um, and you know, I take you back to 2011, at those 18 days of the Egyptian revolution. And you know, I was in Al Jazeera at the time, so we had a front seat to this and in its coverage. And one of the really interesting things when you looked at those 18 days was you saw a state um, in a regime fighting for its life, right? And trying to use all the different tools at its disposable, disposal to control people, to control, control society, and to control the narrative going out to the rest of the world. Um, and there were really three forces which I think come to define those threats that we see to what's going on online. So first of all, you know, we know there was a lot of social media being used. People were uploading videos to YouTube. They were tweeting. Stuff was being organized on Facebook. And the regime responded by shutting down the internet, right? So internet access in Egypt was just, it went off. So for a couple of days, you just couldn't get internet while you were in Egypt. So a very visceral response from this regime trying to control this. And for two reasons. One, so we outside Egypt wouldn't be able to understand or know what's going on. But secondly, to control the population inside, so people couldn't see what these protests were doing. That didn't work out very well, because you know, by that time there was media in Egypt, and there were satellites, and people can find a way to get things out um, in this hyper-connected world that Ethan's described. The next thing the regime did was, well, let's block the mass media, and let's jam satellite signals, and let's harass journalists and lock them up. Right? So, you know, the second part of this triangle, they tried this. And again, this failed, because what happens when you do that is the social networks then light up, and, you know, the worst thing to do is to, protect, uh, to attack journalists because, you know, we're a pack and we all get together and start making a bigger noise about it. And that becomes a story. But then the third thing the regime did was, well, why don't we just dismantle this protest network, right? And we saw the battle in Tahrir where they tried to physically go in and beat down protesters and remove them physically. And again, you know, this is a regime kicking and dying, right? But all of these... I think are important to understand when we talk about freedom of speech, right? Because they're physical threats and intimidation that in less obscene circumstances work, right? So we, we know in countries today where, you know, there isn't this huge confrontation, you know, you can be threatened not to speak, right? And it doesn't need... So we, on the one hand, we have this technical element of freedom of speech online that we often quickly default to, especially when we're in the West, right? We talk about filtering and all of these things, but, you know, there are other ways to chill speech. So I think it's interesting when we look at this, we just pull back and understand the whole gambit of what free speech is. Do, do, we, take, uh, do we take it for granted, the, uh, the, both the, the technical limitations, if you want, as well as the normative, social, political limitations? How, and how do we deconstruct that in a way that makes it useful? So I, I think it's important to understand all the different things that end up constraining speech online. I think you're really smart to bring in 
social norms? What, what do we feel like we can and can't say? Um, I'm spending a decent amount of time focused on Myanmar these days. Uh, and it's very interesting to watch what's going on in Rakhine State, uh, where you have a Rohingya minority um, who are really being sort of erased by the government. They're basically denying that there's this group of people. They're referring to them as Bangladeshis. And it's very interesting to watch how this happens online as well. Um, Facebook finds itself in a real interesting dilemma. There are not a lot of people at Facebook who speak Burmese. And so what's been very common is you report Rohingya speakers for hate speech. Now, they're not saying anything hateful, but it's a great way to silence them. Uh, you see this with Israelis as Palestinians as well. You'll have a lot of Israeli campaigns which will look at Arabic, which again, Facebook doesn't speak especially well, and essentially silence people by flagging it. And so I want to suggest that there's really at least three things that go on. There are the things that we don't say because of our own social norms, and sometimes we actually do need to find ways to say them. There are the things that governments don't want to let us say and that they actually physically constrain networks from letting us say them. Then there are things that corporations don't let us say. And this is something we have to take very seriously. This is such a different media environment than even five or six years ago. Yeah. Five or six years ago, people at this conference would have had laptops out and would have been writing on their blogs. And right now, people are tweeting, they're Snapchatting, maybe Facebook, you know, maybe messaging to small groups. But almost all those services are controlled by large corporations that have speech codes. And certain types of speech become very challenging. My dear friend Jillian York, who works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is living in Berlin, in Germany. And she's been lately photographing uh, photos of self-breast exams. So these are photos that are quite common in Germany. They have a woman with one breast exposed talking about the need to do a self-exam. And by German norms, this is completely acceptable. By US norms, a female breast, my god. And so every time she puts these up, her entire account gets shut down. Wow. And the interesting thing, when Facebook shuts down your account, anything else that uses a login through Facebook doesn't work either. So this is really affecting Jill's dating life because she tries to use Tinder, but her <laughs> login's through Facebook and so she can't date in Berlin anymore. So she's got to find a way to basically adopt to this US quite prudish speech standard to find a way to use this. We've got to watch all three of those. We've got to watch the way that we silence ourselves. We've got to watch the way that governments and corporations silence us as well. We wrote a, a story on your Middle East a, a few years ago now when, um, when uh, Daesh went into Iraq and they closed a lot of the social media. But given the, um, which social media they knew what to close, Facebook, Twitter, etc., and the list was clear, but they'd forgotten Whisper, which had just started to grow. Um, but it was a very small community of kids in Baghdad who were using Whisper. And I don't know if you know the application, but you tell uh, your secret anonymously. So what came out of Baghdad were teenage kids with teenage angst, normal teenage angst <laughs> problems, but with a Daesh problem on top of it <laughs> and anonymously. And so it became this absurd technical, social, um, hormonal uh, conversation coming yeah. up. So it's amazing how people find ways to get information out, and I'm, I'm hoping to, to set up Mohammed with this one, but in Tunisia, as the Arab Spring started, the Tunisian government had blocked most social media. They'd left one thing open, which was Facebook, and they assumed that Facebook was going to be not particularly useful for reporting news, and what they had failed to realize was that Facebook was actually very, very good at uploading video. Mm -hmm. And that ended up being sure. uh, fairly important for the work yep. that Mohammed and Al Jazeera did. Yeah, no, exceptionally important. And I think, you know, just what this speaks to is the ability for people to work around systems of control, right? So, you know, there's, you know, there are all these levers that are being pulled by people who have an interest in suppressing some type of speech. You know, one, one of the really interesting things is, you know, when we've, we've got a client in Malaysia called Malaysia Kini. Um, a news organization, and when they started in 1999, um, you know, press in Malaysia was very tightly controlled by the government. You know, there was almost no free press, and they couldn't get a license to operate a newspaper. 
But they found a loophole in the law because the government had come out saying, well, the internet in Malaysia is going to be you know, on the internet and we're going to build the cyber economy and set up you know, the cyber corridor and we're going to allow people free access to the internet. So they set up an online news organization, which in 1999 was quite you know, new in that part of the world. So they rooted around the law and used it to their own advantage. Of course, subsequently, you know, they've been raided by police. There's been lots of pressure to suppress them. But you know, it speaks to this idea that people find a way. Yeah. You know, um, and, and just on the Malaysia side of this, just because there's an irony behind this, in 1996, I was running a web hosting company called Tripod.com, and our number one user base was in the United States, which made sense because we were in the United States. Our number two user base was Malaysia. And I actually had to print out what was happening on these Malaysian pages, find a political scientist from Malaysia, and ended up discovering that we were hosting the Reformasi movement, mm -hmm. which couldn't find a voice anywhere else in mm -hmm. Malaysian media. And so we tried to figure out what do we do now that we are hosting the Malaysian opposition. We ended up sponsoring Malaysia's Olympic team yeah. in 1996. And I have to say, <laughs> they won a silver in doubles badminton. Ah. <laughs> Fun facts okay. uh, on a Friday morning. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to move into maybe some practical elements of this. How do you identify um, news organizations, media teams, outlets that are pushing the boundaries and are important for the whole ecosystem? And how do you work with them to make that work? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's quite intense and quite, because we, we sort of take this global view of the media and we're working in countries where, you know, in the developing world and countries undergoing a democratic transition. So, you know, a lot of that work is local. So we have people who are either on the ground or based in a region or you know, who are working in that region who can sort of help us and look at emergent trends. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, in the old days when we were doing this, you know, we were looking at printing companies like newspapers and magazines, so it was quite easy. You'd go to a country, okay, who are the, you know, the biggest newspapers and let's find a client. When everything's going online and it's so quick to set something up and things can scale very quickly, um, you know, our methodology of finding things has changed as well. So, you know, we, we had a fund called a Digital News Ventures Fund where the guy running the fund went and basically just did a whole lot of data analysis. What are all the websites? And he started tracking them over time in the country and who's growing and then created a short list there of who's interesting to go and speak to. And then let's analyze the content and see if it falls within this paradigm of independent media and free speech. Um, but we're back to the, a similar problem that we were starting with, which is you're looking for something that has traction, which has a voice, mm -hmm. but there's a qualitative part to this. It's yeah. what are they saying and how yeah. is that contributing mm -hmm. to the conversation in a meaningful way? But let, let's talk about the ways in which politically important media is especially vulnerable. One of my heroes is a guy named Dele Olajede. He's probably Nigeria's most accomplished journalist. He was the first African to win a Pulitzer Prize when he was writing for Newsday in the United States. Um, wrote utterly astounding stories about South Africa and, mm -hmm. and the emergence after yeah. apartheid as well as about uh, the Rwandan genocide. He decided to start an incredibly innovative news site called 234 Next. And for those of you not down with Niger, 234 is the dialing code for the country, so it's a shorthand for what it means. It started as a Twitter feed, and then it became a website, and then in what turned out to be the fatal error, it became a full-color print Sunday newspaper. Now, it needed to be that full-color print Sunday newspaper because that's what Nigerian ministers read. And so to have the influence with the political elite, it needed to go there. But what happened was he had to buy this expensive printing press. He ran on the front page of this color newspaper a photograph of the minister of oil with a duffel bag of cash <laughs> on her desk. After he ran that, oddly enough, no one would advertise with him anymore. Not just the government, but any other business that does business yeah. with the government, which is all of them. And so he found himself owning a printing press that was useless because no one would use it. And three months later, he was bankrupt and there was no product anymore. So you can be silenced so many ways. Mm -hmm. Part of what's so challenging about Mohammed's job is that if you just want to be little and agile, you know, Global Voices, we run for about a million dollars a year. We have 20 staff, we have 1,400 volunteers, we get blocked all the time, we get DDoSed, we get attacked, we get doxxed. We just ignore it because we don't have to make money at the end of the day. 
Malaysia, Kini, some of the, the companies that Mohammed is investing in, they've got to deal with both sides of this coin. How do you actually build a fiscally sustainable business while being politically relevant at the same time? It is one of the hardest jobs out there. And to take the conversation to another side of the spectrum, because of the media outlets is an important part. We've got corporate, we've got technical, we've got social norms constraining us. And then you've got the, the cowboy-esque one-offs, the Snowdens, that come in uh, and release and open a box of information and what happens to that. What does that mean in this context? Well, you know, I think the, you know, what Snowden taught us and what it showed us actually points to something bigger in this whole landscape. Because, you know, in, in, the, in the good old days of censorship, right, we had state that's a, censors. That's a good tweet. <laughs> right? That's a good tweet. Right? You had, you know, these censors and they would say what's good for the state and what's bad for the state. Um, I used to live in Qatar. I remember going to the bookstore in 2005 and to buy a book for my daughter. Um, and I picked up a Winnie the Pooh book, and Piglet had been marked out in every book. And <laughs> you've got you to gotta, you, right? you imagine the censor who's marking out Piglet for some reason. And, the, you, know, this, you know, sure, you know, I'm a Muslim, I don't eat ham, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with Piglet, you know. Piglet's such a great character. But, so imagine, you know, the, awesome. the level of person whose job it is to censor these books, yeah. right? Um, but now what's happened and what Snowden showed us is that, you know, that apparatus has moved from this guy who really, you know, had no understanding of what he was doing, the most zealous person in the country, into the most sophisticated people. Because yeah. what Ethan said, you know, about the Nigerians, that we can all know what's going on in Nigeria, that's really great if you're in espionage in the government, right? So if you're an intelligence agency, because you can also know what's going on in Nigeria, and now you can have access to everybody, what everybody's thinking in Nigeria or America or anywhere else. And it's become much more nefarious. So in the old days, you know, everybody knew what the limits were, right? So you knew what that chilling effect was. But now, you know, you can say what you want, or you think you can say what you want, but there's somebody listening. And what does that mean? for the next 10, 20, 30 years going forward. This is a specific community of people at a conference like this. And I did a, a very unstatistical uh, survey yesterday in preparation for this. Uh, and the results were alarming. People don't care yeah. that they're being monitored, everything that they read, write, talk about. So, so let me first say something on Snowden, and let me try to go to that very scary piece of things. Um, the other thing that I got out of the whole Snowden revelations is that journalism still matters. Um, having this giant trove of documents doesn't mean much until you pull the stories out of it. We've gotten this again out of the Panama Papers. Um, yeah, you could go, you know, try to look at those raw Snowden revelations or the Panama Papers. You wouldn't be able to get anything out of it. And this has happened with the earlier WikiLeaks dumps that actually were public and where you can go and search them. There's not a lot of amateurs who found it. This stuff is actually really hard, and you have to put some real skills into it. As far as this culture of not being scared of surveillance, and my guess is everybody in this room is caught up in NSA surveillance because you're all cosmopolitan people, you're corresponding with someone in the US, and at this point you're all foreign nationals, which means we assert our right to watch everything that you're doing. And given that like 90% of my correspondence <laughs> is with people like Mohammed, you know, I, I'm survey, surveilled all the time. I, I thought I was surveilled because I correspond with yeah, you. Yeah, it's quite possible actually. <laughs> That's probably more dangerous. I, I, um, I think we've normalized surveillance, yep. not just in government, but as a business model. The way that Google makes money, the way that Facebook makes money is by surveilling us. And I think by basically letting advertising take over the web and deciding that the way that everyone was going to make money was by trying to figure out how to target to us, we've all gotten so used to a culture where we're being profiled and surveilled all the time, it's actually very hard to get frightened about the government doing it. In fact, in some ways you go, well, at least the government is being regulated. At least there's probably some protections against it. Imagine what Facebook knows about me. I think we really have to find a way to build a movement that's both questioning government and corporate surveillance at the same time. We have a few more seconds, and I, I think that's the positive note where I'd like us to end. What can we do to build that movement, to be proactive in our daily lives, etc. Because it's easy to go out of here now. Whew, I'm surveilled. Lunch. <laughs> Here's so, what are we one, gonna do? one super simple thing. Um, if you have uh, an iPhone, download Signal. 
Um, if you have an Android phone, download Red Phone. Uh, encrypt your chats, encrypt your voice conversations. At the very least, we can make life harder for these sons of bitches. <laughs> uh, and I encrypt as much as I possibly can. I encrypt love letters to my girlfriend. I just try to encrypt as much as possible to try to make it normal. And what I'm trying to do is create cover traffic for the people who really need it. So. Encrypt and then lunch. Is that the <laughs> Encrypt and, and then, then lunch. lunch. <laughs> Thank you. This was very interesting, enlightening. Uh, we've uh, defined a problem and hopefully uh, leave with some solutions. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, guys. Have a Thank you.